Let's get into the sermon. Now, today I wanted to preach on the sin of laziness. On the sin of laziness. What the Bible calls slothfulness. So you don't see la- the word laziness in the Bible. You'll see slothful, slothfulness. And the person who is slothful is called a sluggard in the Bible. A sluggard. Just the, the great, great word in the King James Bible. You think of a sluggard. You know, the words is like so slow and he's just like so lazy. He's like leaves a trail of mess behind him. That's the Bible's description of the lazy person. And, and we all need this, right? Because we as Christians ought not to be lazy, right? We shouldn't be lazy as Christians. We should, what's the opposite of slothfulness? It's diligence, right? It's working hard. It's attention to detail. It's doing the small things right. Because if you can't do the small things right, you're not going to do the big things right either. Right? So it's, it's a sin to be lazy. And that's what we're going to talk about first. Right? So there's four things I want to talk about when it comes to the sin of laziness. Just to give you an outline so you know where we're tracking in the sermon. Number one, we're going to talk about not being lazy when we're serving the Lord. Right? When we're serving the Lord, we ought not to be lazy. We ought to be diligent in our service for the Lord. Number two, we're going to talk about, we're going to see from the Bible, God's opinion of the sluggard. God's opinion of the sluggard. Number three, we're going to see some other bad habits of lazy people and why lazy people just can't get ahead in life. Right? And number four, we're going to talk about something ironic about laziness. Right? So you're wondering what that is, you'll hear about it at the end. So number one is serving the Lord. Now, laziness is a sin and i'm not just preaching i am sometimes lazy too i need this sermon too you know we as christians ought not to be lazy and there is exhortation in the bible to not be lazy clear exhortation hebrews 6 it says and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the first full assurance of hope unto the end look at this that ye be not slothful See, so it's really clear in the Bible that we should not be lazy. Lazy means you're not willing to work, right? You're not willing to do a good job. You're not willing to do the small tasks. You're not willing to do a good job. You're not willing to be diligent. That's what it means to be slothful. But followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises, right? So we don't want to be a lazy church when it comes to serving the Lord. When we think about when we serve the Lord, I mean, have you ever been to a church where the people are so diligent? I've been to those churches before where, you know, like you, you, you go to that church and things are just happening. Things are so clean. You know, the ladies in the kitchen, everything's so clean. You know, the, all the guys get involved, you know, to, to set up and pack down. And to me, that is such a good testimony of a church. You know, because a church that is lazy, just like a church that doesn't have unity, you know, we talked about different concepts. You know, a church that is growing is where the Spirit is, right? A church that has unity is where the Spirit is. But a a church that is slothful shows that the Spirit of God's not working there because the Spirit of God is working in people's lives. You know, diligence is something that comes out of that, right? Because because it's, it's walking in the Spirit. It's not being slothful. Romans 12, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Look at this. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit. So we see not only is the opposite of slothfulness and laziness diligence, right? Doing a good job, working hard, but it's being passionate as well about it. Right? So sometimes we're lazy in being passionate about the things of God. Why? Because it takes work to be passionate, doesn't it? It's harder to be passionate and fervent about something than it is to just coast through your Christian life. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So we don't want to be lazy, both because remember point one is serving the Lord. So we don't want to be lazy in our spiritual life when it comes to serving the Lord, when it comes to soul winning. You don't want to be lazy. right? A lot of us are being lazy in our soul winning. We're not going soul winning at all. That's laziness. right? A lot of us are being lazy when it comes to church. How many times have you not come to church just because you were too lazy to come to church? It was too hard. You were too tired. 
You know, the drive was too far. You know, people often use, you know, little excuses to not come to church. You know, my wife and I were just joking. You know, when uh, in Mexico, uh, one of the, the bishops over there would always say when you have a huge family, right? But when one person is sick in the family, none of the family can go to church. You know, as opposed to one of the parents taking the rest of the children and the sick child staying at home. That happens as well in churches where people, you know, they, they're too lazy to come to church. They use any excuse possible to not come to church. We got to be Christians where we think of reasons to do something, not make excuses why not to do something. So we don't want to be lazy just in the Christian life, right? Lazy in church, you know, not coming on time because you're too lazy to get ready. Do you know what I mean? Like coming on time to church is a sign of laziness. People always say like, oh, I'm too busy, all these sorts of things. No, busy. there's no such thing as too busy, right? It's all about priorities. Because we've always, we've all, all of us have the same amount of time. It's just how we prioritize our time. So it's the same when we're late. When we're late to things, it's because we didn't do the work. We, didn't, we weren't organized enough to get somewhere on time, right? So it's just a, it's just a, it's just a product of laziness, not doing the work, not doing the extra work to be organized to get somewhere on time. You know, we don't want to be lazy in our Bible reading. Think about, you know, I think everyone, including me, is guilty of this, right? How, if we talk about how much time we don't have to read our Bible or to do such and such, but I'm sure you've got plenty of time to watch videos on YouTube, plenty of time to scroll through the Facebook feed, plenty of time to read up on all other sorts of things that you're interested in you know, whether it's some sort of recreational activity or whatnot. Got all this time to do this stuff, you know, watch sport, watch movies, but you don't have 10, 15 minutes a day just to read the Bible. People say like, oh, it's so hard to read through the Bible in a year. I mean, we read through the passage today, 10, 15 minutes max a day, and you'll read through the Bible in a year. You know, that's just, that's just like one time in the day where you didn't spend that 10, 15 minutes on the Facebook feed and you would have done your daily Bible reading, right? Laziness, slothfulness in doing things for the Lord. But not only in church we don't want to be lazy, right? We don't want to be lazy in our secular life either, right? When it comes to working at our job. So look at what it says here in Colossians 3. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive... Right, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. So what is it saying here? When you go and you work at your job, when you, when you do any work in general, because this is a good principle, whether you work at your job or whether you work at church or whether you do service for the Lord, don't just do things because somebody's watching you. That's an attribute of a lazy person. A lazy person needs somebody constantly supervising them, telling them what to do, looking over them, making sure they do a good job, and they only do a good job when someone's watching them. And this is what the Bible is saying not to do. You don't do things in your job or in work just with eye service as men pleasers, just doing something because something's, somebody's watching you. That's a lazy person. But in singleness of heart, Fearing God. Look at this. And whatsoever ye do, so look the opposite of laziness. Do it heartily. Remember, fervent in spirit, as to the Lord and not unto men. So, really, that's why I grouped it under the same topic, right? I grouped number one as serving the Lord, because whether you serve the Lord in this church or whether you serve the Lord at your workplace, it, you're serving the Lord in both instances. Because you should be doing your job at work as though you are serving Jesus Christ. That's why your boss shouldn't have to keep following up on you. You should be going above and beyond. He doesn't always have to be checking on you and measuring you just for you to do your job. Right? At our work, we should be doing it as though we are serving the Lord. I would say here, Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of person. So we don't want to be lazy both at church and in our work, right? And with some Christians, it's like that. Where at church, for some reason, 
you know, I, I'm not talking about anyone in particular here. You know, I'm just saying, I've, you know, people are like this. Where at church, they work really hard. You know, everything's done well, you know. But then at their workplace, they're a sluggard. Always doing the minimum, you know, always trying to like, you know, always complaining about the, the boss getting them to do something. Some people are the other way around. You know, at work, they work really hard. They work really diligent. And then when they come to church, they're just slacking off. Don't help out at all. You know, it's like, you know, they, they might be like a manager at work. You know, they might, they might like do, do a job at work and it's like, you, can't you do the same job for the Lord at church? You know, so this is what I'm saying. Here, you don't want to be lazy in any area of your life, right? So don't think just because people aren't seeing you at church or people aren't seeing you at work that you're getting away with it. Because the Bible says, hey, God sees everything that's happening. He that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. God is watching what we're doing, whether it's at church or whether it's on the job. We ought not to be lazy as believers. And it's a terrible testimony as a Christian. If you complain at work, you're lazy at work, that's a terrible testimony of a Christian. Because right? a Christian ought to be somebody that's fervent, working. Why? Because they're serving the living God. They're serving a God that is true. So do you really believe that God, you're serving God at work if you're a sluggard at work? And it's the same in a church. Right? If people are lazy in a church, Christians are lazy. If a church is lazy in the work of the Lord, it's a terrible testimony. All right, let's go on to the second point. Second point is God's opinion of the sluggard. I want to show you this passage in Proverbs. And we're, going to look, we're going to be looking at a lot of passages in Proverbs. Because Proverbs is really the book that talks about laziness, slothfulness, the sluggard. And why is that? Because, you know, when you read chapter 1 of Proverbs, it gives us the reason, one of the reasons why, you know, a lot of these Proverbs are written. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. So, right, this is like an all-rounded wisdom that we learn from Proverbs. But look at this. It says, To give subtlety to the simple, look at this, to the young man, knowledge, and discretion so if you're wondering why in proverbs there's so much about being lazy not you know being a good leader you know not fellowshipping with the wrong sort of people you know there's a lot of warnings about the strange woman as well it's because the proverbs in a sense are geared towards young men and that's what young men struggle with young men struggle with being lazy being responsible you know, hanging around the wrong crowd and being the wrong, you know, having the wrong examples for them in their life. And, you know, women. Women, you know, that's what King Solomon said. He says, I find, I can't remember exactly how he said it. I haven't put this in memory. He says, there's nothing more, it's like, I don't know what the word was. Like, that he finds more, uh, ah, I wish I had it on top of my head. It's like he's just saying the woman causes him a lot of problems, basically. <laughs> A wise man will hear and will incre increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. As a dog... So now we're going on to Proverbs 28. This is, this is uh, Proverbs uh, 26, sorry. Where we see God's opinion of the slothful man. And it's interesting that in this proverb, it repeats a few of these proverbs throughout Proverbs, but I want to show you what it says here and what God thinks of the sluggard. Verse 11, As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Right? So you might be thinking, well, if God here is talking about fools, right? What has that got to do with the sluggard? Well, let's, let's read on. So the, first of all, it starts, about, starts off talking about a fool. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly, to his, to his, uh, his uh, silliness, right? Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. So think about verse 12, right? Verse 12 is saying, hey, verse 11, I just wanted to give you the context to see, hey, he's talking about fools. And then he says in verse 12, if you see a man who's wise in his own conceit, what does that mean? When, you're, when you think yourself 
so wise that you have puffed yourself up and you think you're proud of yourself. Right? So when you're conceited, it means you're sort of puffed up with pride. So he's saying, so, uh, he's saying a person who is wise in his own conceit says there is more hope of a fool than of him. Right? Now it goes into the slothful man. The slothful man saith, there is a lion in the way, a lion is in the streets. And I won't, I'll, I'll go through these in a moment because they're, they're, they're mentioned in other Proverbs too. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. Right? He loves sleep. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom. It grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. Now look at verse 16. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Now if you remember what we read in verse 12, it says here, hey, seest thou a wise man in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than for him. So what is God saying here? There's more hope for a fool than for a sluggard. Right? Because the sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Now, why is that? Let me see. If, let, me, let me give you my take on why this is the case. Now, number one is because the sluggard doesn't want to do any work. So when you're not actually doing, you're not actually learning from experience. Right? A lot of people that do, they do the work, they learn from experience. They have reasons for why they do things. The seven men that can render a reason. But the sluggard it's all theory for him. It's all in his mind, right? Because he hasn't actually done the work. So a sluggard, he, he thinks he knows it all. He thinks he knows what to do. He's wise in his own conceit, but he's just speaking. He's not actually speaking from experience, right? Because he lacks the experience from actual work. Now, how many people do you know that at work? Where in theory, they, they, they know everything, right? But they, they don't actually know. They're not actually wise about it because they haven't actually experienced it. Right? Now, why does it say here that there's more hope of a fool than of the sluggard, the person that doesn't actually want to do the work? That there's more hope than a fool? Because a fool actually will try and do something. If you think about it, right? Like a fool, he, he may be foolish, but he's actually doing something. And he's saying, hey, there's more hope for the fool because the fool may get something accomplished more than a sluggard because a sluggard's not even willing to start. He's not even willing to do the work. That's why there's more hope. That's my take on it when I read that, why it's saying there's more hope of a fool than of him. Because as a fool starts to do, right, you start to learn. And hopefully the fool doesn't stay a fool. But if a sluggard is a fool, he'll never learn. Because right? he'll never do. And it reminds me of the verse in James, right? James 1, you know, that if you are a hearer of the word and not a doer, you're like unto a man, you know, beholding your nat his natural face in the glass. Right? And you're, you're going to be a forgetful hearer. So it's the same as that. Even a foolish person who's trying to serve God, they're going to learn from that experience and hopefully no longer be a fool. But if you're lazy, you're just going to be a forgetful hearer because you're not going to be a doer of the work. And then you'll remain a fool. Right? You, you won't have any hope. Okay. So that's what God thinks of the sluggard. You think about it. He, th he actually thinks less of the sluggard than of the fool. And if you are less than a fool, you're not at a good place. So we don't want to be that. We don't want to be lazy. Now let's talk about all these other excuses. that These, these are other excuses that lazy people use, right? And now we go in a different proverb now. Because you see I was in Proverbs 26 and it's sort of mentioned. You see there's a lion in the streets. And we'll see it in other t t parts of Proverbs as well. You see the door turning upon the hinges, the sleeping, right? And then the slothful man hiding his hands in his bosom. Now, what, what do you think that is, hiding your hands in your bosom? This is what I think of when I think of hiding your hands in your bosom. Right? Kind of like, no, I'm not going to do it. That's what I think of when I think of sluggard with his hands in his bosom. So let's talk about the first one. The slothful man saith, there is a lion with it. I shall be slain in the streets. Now, what does a lazy person do? A lazy person is always making excuses. You know, the, the, the excuses are so outrageous. This, this, is saying, this is what he's saying. The, the excuses start raising. He's saying the slothful man doesn't want to do something. He's saying, well, you know what? There might be a lion outside and that lion might kill me. So I better not even start and go outside. 
This is what the Bible is, how the Bible is painting the slothful man, just making huge excuses. And we do this in our lives. We make the most silly excuses why we shouldn't start something, why we shouldn't do something, and we're just being lazy. Here's another one in Proverbs 20, just excuses for why lazy people don't want to do things. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. What is that saying? He doesn't want to plow his field so he has food later on because it's too cold outside. Right? Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. Now this, I, when I see this proverb about the sluggard, this is what I think about people that don't go soul winning when it's too cold, it's too hot, you know, the weather's just not right, you know, a little bit of drizzle, you know, they say it's like Goldilocks, right? You just need it to be just right so that you'll go soul winning. But there'll probably be a lion in the streets, you know, because that's the other one, right? Or well, people, you know, you say, oh, the lion in the streets is the fear that's not really there. People, well, people are going to slam the door on me. People are going to do this. People are going to do that. And then you go soul winning and they're more scared of you. Like when I am at the door, people are more scared of me than, than I am of them, you know? So it's, it's completely the other way around. And this is where I'm saying there's more hope of a fool for than the sluggard because the sluggard is just making excuses because they're too lazy to actually do the work. But when you actually get out there, it's not that hard. It's not actually that difficult. You know, it's not that scary when you go out and preach the gospel to people and you go and talk to strangers it's actually not that scary it's just all in the mind it's the lion that's in the streets and then because people are lazy they make up other excuses oh you know i'm not a very good talker well you can go as a silent partner you don't have to do any talking right so you say like i'm not a talker i don't know what to say you don't have to say anything you just have to come as a silent partner and just pray for the person that does, is doing the talking right and if it's too cold hey we we go soul winning you know, I go soul winning when it's cold, when it's raining. You know, obviously, if you've got a baby or you're pregnant and things like that, you know, that, that's where I, I'm a bit more lenient. But the guys, especially, you know, I go soul winning when it's cold. I've been soul winning when it's, when it's been hailing outside. You know, in Phoenix, when it was like, you know, the equivalent of 40 degrees out. You just, you just deal with it, right? Because, you know, like, like, like the preachers would always tell me, if it's hot outside, hell is hotter. You know, and what's a little bit of wet? You know, you get wet out there. You know, usually people are home when it's raining. That's why when you go soul winning when it's raining, everyone's home. You know, and if there's a porch, then you're all good, right? You just need the umbrella to get from door to door and everyone's home. So sometimes when, when you think it's a worse time to go soul winning, it's actually a better time because people are home. So there's always an excuse, even if it's just made up. You know, instead of, but see, instead, like I said before, instead of having excuses why not to do something why don't you think of reasons to do something you know rather than think it's too cold outside i don't want to go soul winning or it's too hard or i'm not doing the talk just think about well people are going to hell because we don't go soul winning you know we could knock so many doors as a church if more of us went soul winning we'd be able to reach so many more people and canvas this area multiple times you know like we've never re-knocked a place in this neighborhood but I tell you what, if we had 20, 30, 40 soul winners, we could re-knock this, this area of the map that we've knocked and follow up on people, go back again. You know, because there's people there that weren't home the first time. But if we're too lazy, if we make up excuses why we don't go, rather than thinking of reasons to go, to serve the Lord, to do something in your spiritual life, to lay up some treasures in heaven, spending some time serving the Lord out in the highways and hedges, you know, compelling them to come in rather than spending your time just holidaying, spending your time in pleasure, spending your time amongst the thorns, right? The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches. So not, don't make excuses like the sluggard. Think of reasons to do things. What's the second one? Sleeping. Just loving sleep too much. Now, this is one that's like, you know, when I see these verses, I'm just like, oh, you know, because <laughs> I, I love sleeping, right? And that's why the Bible's telling me, love not sleep. You know, so you can't love sleep. You're going to love not sleep. But this is interesting in verse 19, and I'm sure you can experience this in your own life. The Bible says here, slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. The Bible's actually teaching here that when you're lazy and you don't work hard, you actually are more tired 
than if you work hard. Right? So people that love sleep, people that sleep too much are actually more tired than people that just get up. And, and I, know, I, I don't know all the science behind it, but you guys might know, you know, depending on what sleep pattern you get into. I've heard people tell me before that you know, if you wake up and then you go back to sleep and you don't actually get into the proper sleep, you'll wake up groggier, right? So you know, sometimes it's better just to wake up and, and, and not be groggy than just keep on sleeping and then cast yourself into a deep sleep. Look at what it says here, love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. So excessive sleep actually makes you more tired. And think about this fact, guys. How many hours of the day do they recommend that you sleep? If you think about it, eight hours, they say. They give or take, however many. Some people say you should only sleep six hours. Some people say sleep ten hours. But let's say on average you say a, a healthy day of sleep is eight hours. Now, how many hours are there in a day? 24 hours. So if you just sleep the healthy amount of hours, what portion of the, of the day are you sleeping? One third of the day. Can you believe that? So if you were just a healthy sleeper your whole life, you have spent a third of your life in bed. One third. If you live 100 years, 33 years with your eyes closed, sleeping. And we talk about we don't have enough time. You know, we, we, you know, a third of the life is already gone in the bed. Just normal sleep. And you want to sleep more? You want to give more of your life away just to lazing around in a bed? I don't. Life is too short. Life is way too short to spend it sleeping. And this is why the Bible is saying, you know, don't love sleep because you are wasting your God-given time to do something for the Lord, right? You already sleep away a third of your life. How much more do you want to give to it? Let's talk about this last one. A slothful man hideth his hand in his bosom and will not so much as bring it to his mouth. Now, what do I think of when I think of this passage in Proverbs? Right, I told you, folding the arms. Now, when I think of the sluggard that it's saying here, a slothful man hideth his hand in his bosom, he's stubborn. He will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. It's like a sluggard is not even willing to do the most smallest task, which is bringing his hand to his mouth to feed himself. That's what the picture that the Bible is giving here. And it's sort of saying here with the sluggard, the sluggard doesn't want to do the small task, even though it actually benefits him, right? And it's so hard for him to do it. If you see what it said here in Proverbs 26, it said here, the slothful hideth his hand in his bo bosom. Look at this. It grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. So it's saying the slothful man's folding his arms just to bring his hand to his mouth to feed himself. It's just like, oh, so hard. Do you expect me to do this for just to put it to my mouth? That's the attitude of the sluggard. It's just so difficult just to do the smallest thing, just to bring your hand to your mouth, even if it's for your own good. He's not even willing in this proverb to feed himself. All right, let's go on. That's why the Bible has a lot to say about the slothful, about the sluggard. If you've never read Proverbs. This is Proverbs 10. This is like my favorite one about the sluggard. Because I could, you know, it wasn't until I managed people, right, and had, had to get people to do stuff for me at work that I realized this rings so true to about, about the sluggard. What does it say here? As vinegar to the teeth. And as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. As vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. Now, have you ever heard in the business world the, the saying, death by a thousand paper cuts? <laughs> so they'll say, you know, there's just these little things you know, that I just so, but like a business can die just because it's just it's all these small things just end up killing it, 
right? Yeah. And this is what the slug it is like to them that send him. It's just these small things that just build up. It's like, it feels like death by a thousand paper cuts. Because think about what this proverb is saying, right? When it says, as vinegar to the teeth, what is that saying? That's talking about tooth decay, isn't it? You think about vinegar, that's why tooth, if you, if you know dentistry, hopefully I've got my facts right. This, this is how what I know about dentistry. I'm not a dentist. But, you know, if you eat, if you drink like vinegary stuff, that's like sometimes why kids, when they drink too much soda, all their teeth are all like filed down, right? Because it's gnawing away at their teeth. So if you think about vinegar, so he's saying a slug, it is like vinegar to the teeth. That's why I think about the death by a thousand paper cuts. Because it's not like the sluggard just is a punch to the face and just takes teeth out, right? The sluggard just like slowly like vinegar, it's just this gruesome slow decay of your teeth. And that's what it's like if you're the sluggard to somebody that sends you. That's what you're like to your boss. If you're lazy at work and you're wondering why, hey, there was a promotion. Well, everyone got a pay rise except me. You know, well, there was a promotion. Why wasn't I first in line for that promotion? That's because somebody who's lazy at work, this is what the boss thinks of them. Because it's not just like somebody that doesn't turn up. Right? Somebody that just doesn't turn up, you fire them. Right? But the, the sluggard, they there, they're there. The sluggard turns up. But he just makes it so difficult to get the job done. Right? That's why it's like smoke to the eyes. It's not that, it's not that the sluggard just blocks your vision. Right? He's not there stops you because if he's not there sometimes sometimes when the sluggard is not there it's easier for things to do right because you're not constantly picking up after the sluggard and whatnot whereas here it's saying like vinegar to the teeth is the slow decay of your teeth and a smoke to the eyes so you can actually see through the smoke you know if you think about smoke but it just makes it harder to see and it's like just that annoying stinging of your eyes if you've ever stood around a campfire that's what this is saying about the sluggard a vinegar to the teeth smoke to the eyes so is the sluggard to them that send him so if you're always doing the minimum right if you're always making excuses at work don't be surprised when you're last in line for a pay rise when you're last in line for the promotion when you go for the role and you don't get it because your boss doesn't want to give you a good referral right because if you've been a sluggard if you're at work you're always checking when you can get home you're always trying to do the minimum you know, your boss is like, sees you work and it's like, yeah, well, you, you, you did what I asked, but, you know, did you do a good job? This is what I find is with developers. If you've ever dealt with developers, you know, this is why you need business analysts with development work. Because a developer, they just, they just do exactly what you tell them to do. No more or no less, right? So let me give you an example, right, with the developer. Let's say you said you're building a house and you said, you know, I want a painting on the wall. And you said to the developer, I want you to put a painting on the wall. I'm using building a house as an analogy for developing software, right? Well, what a developer would do is we'll probably just get a nail in the painting and just like nail it to the wall. Be like, done. Painting on the wall. And you're like thinking, wait a second. It's not even straight. You've ruined my painting. You know, you could have stuck it in a nice place. Like, you know, like here, it's like it's stuck nicely. It's not just, you know, stuck like off, just off center and crooked and there's a nail going right through it. So that's what it's like with the slugger. The slugger just does the minimum. He'll say, hey, look, the painting is on the wall. I've done what you asked me to do. But somebody who's diligent will consider these things and think, hey, maybe the boss wants it to look nice. Maybe he doesn't want me to ruin his painting. You know, maybe he wants it straight because when it's crooked, it looks bad. These are the sort of things that diligent people do that sluggards don't. So if you're lazy at work, you're always doing the minimum. You know, don't be surprised when the boss isn't that excited to have you around, you know, because you're as vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, according to the Bible. So, and like I said, don't be surprised when the boss doesn't want to give you a positive reference either. And this is one thing you have to keep in mind. If you're lazy at work, you know, you reap what you sow. If you are lazy at work and you're lazy in your life, and then you're going to need some help from somebody, they are not going to want to give you a glowing reference. Number three, now what are some other bad habits? I just wanted to show you this passage from Proverbs 24, where Solomon, Solomon's writing this proverb, and it's interesting because he walks by, the Bible says, I went by the field of the slothful. So pro probably, 
Solomon is walking through his kingdom, right? And looking at the fields of the people in his kingdom. And he sees a field from somebody who's lazy. And he says, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. Now, why does the Bible call a lazy person void of understanding? Because a lazy person doesn't know that it's going to benefit him in the long run, right? I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, so what does it mean when the Bible says, and lo? It means, and look. So lo is short for look. So he says, and lo. Like when the Bible says, lo and behold. Right? It's saying, look and look. That's what it's saying. It's the behold them. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof. So nettles are like weeds. Nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. So this is what a wise person does. A wise person can see a bad example and learn from it. They don't necessarily have to experience it, right? They can see cause and effect. What does he learn? Verse 33. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want. As an armed man basically it's the maintenance isn't it it's the little things so lazy people aren't willing to have the foresight to do that maintenance to do the little things that actually benefit them and you can see that it, a lazy person it's not just that they're not doing it at all it's just that the the slow decay right the vinegar to the teeth the smoke to the eyes and this may take you know a, a lazy person may not see the result of their laziness straight away Right? So when you, you say, for example, for your job promotion, and you're thinking, oh, why? Well, it's because over time, you're just slowly getting worse and worse and worse. And it's saying with your garden. It's saying here, hey, it's just a little sleep. It's, always, it's the little excuses, just making small excuse after small excuse. That's what it's like in the spiritual life too. When you just make small excuse after small excuse. Hey, I just won't read my Bible today. I'll go soul winning next week. Yeah, I'll skip church another time. You know, I'll just let that go. I'll just let this go. I'll let that go. Right? And then four or five years later, you know, your poverty spiritually is like one that travel. You know, somebody that's traveling all the time, right? They're not saving and they want as an armed man. Somebody's gone to battle because they haven't been working, right? They come back and they don't have anyone supporting them. So you're not willing to do the maintenance work. You didn't have the foresight to do the task when it was easier. See, when I think of little by little, and then you have a, now a vineyard that is covered with nettles, I think of washing dishes, right? Or keeping the kitchen clean. I talk about this with my wife all the time, right? This one's for you. <laughs> it's like, you know, when I'm in the kitchen, right? And I'm very rarely in the kitchen. But when I do, when my wife gives birth, one thing I know, because I've worked at McDonald's, is just you clean as you go. That's what you learn at McDonald's. You clean as you go. You're constantly wiping down tables, just putting things in place, just doing small things as you go. I'm sure those of us who work in hospitality understand this concept because it's easier to do that than it is at the end just to clean up this huge mess all over the place because the job's already half done as you go. That's why in Spotio we do it that way too. Spotio, we kind of do it as we go so that at the end there's not this huge collection of data having to remember all this stuff to go back in. So this is the same here. You know, it's just doing that little bit of maintenance. Keeping things clean and ordered around the house is way easier than cleaning up a huge mess, especially with dishes because things start crusting in and it's harder to scrub it out. You know, that pot, after you cook, right, if you just gave it a quick rinse, it's going to be so much easier to clean than if you just sit it in the sink and then it just all dries on. Now you're going to have to get the steel wool out, right? And like, so laziness... It can be a series of bad habits, right, that destroy your life slowly over time. We already talked about them a bit, just getting that, that, that bad habit of sleeping. So if you think about this, this little sleep, little slumber, little folding of the hands, it's the bad habits of lazy people that just slowly, slowly destroy either you spiritually or even physically, right, in terms of your job and your ability to make money. So it's sleep entertainment, you know, social media, spending too much time on social media, you know, the, just the bad habit of just making excuses all, all the time, right? Procrastinating. You just keep putting things off until, you know, it's last minute. Now, you know, it's, it, 
now it's urgent. Now everything's urgent because you're always leaving things to the last minute. People that are too risk averse. That's a bad habit too. You, just don't, you know, people are too scared to take risks. Don't want to, don't want to ever take a chance. Um, or another one is just blaming others. It's never your fault. You know? These are these bad habits that just slowly destroy you. Look what it says in Ecclesiastes. By much slothfulness, the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands, the house droppeth through. Now look what it says here in Proverbs 13. This is an interesting one. It says here, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's any mystery why you know, the sluggard is just covetous, but he doesn't have anything in the end. Why? Because he's not willing to do the work, right? The desire of the sloth will kill him, for his hands refuse to labor. He's not willing to work. To co he coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. Now, when I thought of this verse where it says here, you know, for his hands refuse to labor, he coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. When we read that, sometimes we just think of material possessions, like the righteous just, you know, are w willing to just give away everything, right? Which, you know, is probably true to a certain extent as well. But what I think when I read this passage in Proverbs, when it says the diligent or the righteous, that it's comparing it to the slothful, right? Where they're willing to give and because of that, they get back. I think of reaping and sowing. Where they're willing to put in some time and they get something back. Think about volunteer work. You know, you, you're willing to volunteer and then you get some skills that allow you to get a better job. But if you're so lazy, you're like, well, I'm not gonna, you're not even paying me to do that work. That's why the Bible says the slothful man's void of understanding. Because he doesn't see that it's not always the monetary value that you get back that you're getting from the time that you put in. So it's the same when you do more at your job and you think, well, they're not paying, you know, I hear this all the time previously at my work where people would say, you know, I'm not doing that. That's, that's below my pay grade. Yeah, yeah. Right? Saying, you don't pay me enough to do that. But if you just did it, then, like I said, when promotion time comes around or that role opens, who do you think is going to be first in line when you've been diligent and you've been a blessing to your boss, you haven't been a curse to your boss? Right? So it's like that with volunteer work as well. You know, where you're willing to put in, you reap what you sow. Now, I've had pe many people, you know, or a few people from this church ask me for a reference. You know, it's the same at your job. It's the same here. Now, if somebody's going to ask me to vouch for them for a job or vouch for them for something that they need to go, go for, I've had multiple people at this church ask me for things. And sometimes it's, I don't know what I can vouch for because you're never at church. You're never out soul winning. You're always late. You're, I mean, what... It's the, same in your, it's the same in your secular work, right? If you want your boss to be able to help you get ahead, you need to be willing to give and spare not and realize, have the understanding that you're reaping what you sow. So do above and beyond what is expected of you. And even if your boss doesn't pay you, even if your job doesn't pay you, you know who's going to pay you? Jesus, right? Because he's going to pay you back for doing what's right because ultimately, you're serving him. That's why the Bible says here, the hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. The slothful always works for somebody else because he's too lazy to be his own boss. He's too lazy to get ahead, to manage other people, to make decisions, right? Because he's not diligent. It's the diligent that are in charge, not the lazy. And this is what we learn in the parable of the talents. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. So this is the man with the one talent that was lazy. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers that at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. You see this man with the one talent, he was so lazy that he wasn't even willing to put the money to the bank and do no work to earn interest for his master. Take therefore the talent from it and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto everyone that hath shall be given 
and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Look at Proverbs 18, verse 9. Here's another interesting passage about the slothful. It says, He also that is slothful in his work, is lazy in his work, is, look at this, is brother to him that is a great waster. Now, how does being slothful and being a great waster related? Because what, that's what the proverb is saying here. It's saying the slothful man is related to the wasteful man. Right? They, they have a close relationship there. But why do lazy people waste a lot of things? Well, number one, here's an idea, because things get thrown away because it's easier to throw things away than to maintain them. So the slothful people is just, just throwing things away, you know, throwing food away rather than keeping it, rather than taking, you know, that's one of my pet, pet peeves, <laughs> is people taking too much food and then it going into the bin. You know, if you take food, just take what you can eat. If you're not going to eat it, don't take it. Because then, you know, people's labor goes into buying that food. That food is not free. But the slothful man is void of understanding. He doesn't care, right? Things get thrown away. Because it's easier to throw things away and buy something new than it is to be frugal or to take care of things, to look after things and maintain them so you don't have to keep replacing them. You see, saving... Money takes diligence, doesn't it? Right? You, people, some people, they don't want to work. They don't, they don't want to work for the money before buying something. So especially when it comes to borrowing money, this is another way a lazy person wastes money because they're too lazy to do the work to earn the money to buy something outright. They'll go and get a credit card. They'll go and take out a loan. And then now what are you doing? You're paying interest on interest, on interest every year that you don't pay it back. And it's a lot of money being wasted. You know, I've preached before on compound interest, right? If you can save earlier on, that interest can work in your favor, right? Money is working for you. But the slothful man is constantly working to pay off that debt because they wanted that thing, right? He's greedy, he's covetous all the day long. It's easier to just take out the loan and get the thing that you want than it is to work for the money first, to get that delayed gratification of saving and paying something off rather than just taking out a loan. And I've heard this from rich people a lot, people that have a lot of money, that it's not always about making more money. And you think, you know, one, you, you say like, hey, a dollar earned is not always a dollar more. Why? Because you've got tax. You know, if you, if you make, especially if you're making quite a bit of money, right? Every dollar you earn, sometimes it's like 40, 50% of that money you don't even see. So it's not that a dollar saved is a dollar earned. Sometimes a dollar saved is like $2 earned because you might have to earn $2 to make an extra dollar. But if you can find a way to save a dollar, it's as though you made $2, right? Because that was one extra dollar you have that you didn't spend. So saving money takes diligence, right? It takes some organization. It takes some work to get ahead. But if you're too lazy to be organized and get ahead, that's why you end up wasting money. You see, any fool can spend money on things last minute. Any fool can just go to the, go to the, the, the 7-Eleven or go, you know, you go fill up your fuel, right? And, you know, rather than being diligent about maybe buying snacks or buying things, you know, you go to the, you run out of toilet paper at home. And now you've got to go to the server and buy toilet paper for like 20 bucks for a pack or something. I mean, you can buy it $5 a pack because you were a sluggard, because you were too lazy to be organized and think about those things. So I, I think about organizing events. You know, if you leave things till the last minute, things always become expensive. You know, you need to send paperwork off. Now you've got to send it express. You know, you've got to buy plates and cutlery. Now you can't buy it in bulk. Now you've just got to buy it from Coles. You buy things like that. So that's why when you're slothful, when you're not diligent, when you're not organized, you're a brother to him that is a great waster because you waste a lot of the Lord's money on unnecessary things, on loans, spending too much money, not buying in bulk. And that's another attribute of a slothful man, that he's not, he doesn't, doesn't appreciate the work it takes to earn, earn something. The slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting. He's always eating of other people's things. 
but the substance of a diligent man is precious. That's another reason why a slothful man is a great waster, because he didn't do the work to earn things. He doesn't value the work it takes to actually earn money. He doesn't appreciate material possession because he didn't work for it. And that's why lazy people think the government should just pay for everything. Lazy people think that the government owes them a job. Lazy people want a minimum wage. Rather than them just earning more money by doing more work, they want the government to force businesses to pay them a minimum wage. Minimum wage is a lazy person's law. Because if you work hard, you're never going to be on minimum wage. You know, minimum wage doesn't affect people that work hard because they're not earning minimum wage. And then if you put a minimum wage in because you're lazy, you know who it affects? It affects the people that actually do struggle to make minimum wage. They're going to lose out on the job because if minimum wage is $18 an hour, $15 an hour, and you have a disabled person that, is, that they, can, they can only do an amount of $10 an hour, but if somebody's willing to give them a job, now you make that business owner a criminal for hiring that person at a lower rate. And you're actually removing the bottom rung. It's funny, people that are for minimum wage don't realize the effect of minimum wage. They think minimum wage is putting bottom rungs on the ladder, but when you put in a minimum wage, you actually remove all the bottom rungs of the ladder because now people try to climb the ladder. You know, you start off at $5 an hour, you go to $6 an hour, you're trying to climb and gain skills. You've just removed all those rungs because now somebody's not going to hire them unless they can bring in $15 an hour, unless they can bring in $16 an hour. That's why minimum wage is a lazy person's policy. So lazy people think everything should be free. You know, because they don't, they don't think the, subst the substance of the diligent man is precious. See, people that work hard, they don't expect to get everything for free because they know it took work to make it happen. See, so that's why lazy people, you know, they want to tax the rich. You see that? Hey, let's just tax the wealthy, take their money from them and give it to me. That's lazy people. Lazy people want uh, something for nothing. And lazy people complain about things and they don't want to be part of the solution. That's a lazy attribute as well, where you just complain about things, but you're not doing anything to be part of the solution. All right, Proverbs 6. What's, what should we look at? What, what should we do so that we're not lazy? Well, the Bible actually gives us an animal. Oh, I don't know if you call it an animal, right? An, an insect. To look at, to consider as a good example of what is not lazy. Proverbs 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. It is so interesting that the, the example of a diligent insect or creature is also one of the smallest creatures that exists. It's like it's so insignificant, right? A little ant. And yet God is saying, hey, look at that little thing. Look at the ant and learn from the ant. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler. Doesn't that remind you of not with eye service as men pleases? Right? Provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. So you see how she works for a future. She has, she has a foresight to do the little so that she's ready when hard times come. Now this sounds familiar, doesn't it? How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Oops. Look at this. Verse 10. Yet a little sleep. Isn't this familiar? A little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and they want as an armed man. So it's not rocket science what you have to do to not be a sluggard, right? It's just the complete opposite of what lazy people do. You, know, you just need to work hard, be diligent, be organized. You need to plan ahead. But sometimes you may have to remove vain activities out of your life. If you have too many vain activities in your life and distractions, that also is encouraging laziness and slothfulness. Another thing that can help you is you need to schedule in the small tasks. Remember, it's just little sleep, little slumber, little folding of the arms, but you can be diligent the opposite way around. 
just by doing, scheduling in the little tasks, just getting the little things done slowly by slowly, and then eventually you do things bigger. You know, just doing a little bit of Bible reading every day, a little bit of soul winning every day, and that's how you can accomplish great things. So you want to put things into your schedule that forces you to do it. Another one I think is, you know, the Bible talks a lot about the sluggard being idle. See, if you're not busy enough, that also encourages you to be lazy. Because when you're busy, then you make sure things get done. Rather than having too much time, too much time to just sit around doing nothing, too much time to sleep, and then you cast yourself into more of a deep sleep. So stay busy. It also reduces procrastination. Right, if you keep yourself busy, you won't put things off because you know I'm not going to have the time to do it then. I have to start doing it now. But also some other things with the ant. If you think about the ant, they live in a colony, don't they? They're so diligent in what they do. They, they can come together. They do their part. right? The ants don't complain. They just go about their day. They do their part. And when all the ants come together, you know, have you seen those ant colonies? It's, it's, it's insane. Uh, when you look at what ants can accomplish, even though individually they're so small. But el what else do we see from the ant? We see the ant taking initiative. So we see the ant didn't have to be told what to do, having no guide, overseer, or ruler. So not only is the ant not an, a men pleaser, the ant doesn't need to be told what to do. The ant takes initiative. What are other things? Don't oversleep. You know, stop making excuses. Now, the last thing I just wanted to finish on, and this is my last point, this is a quick point. It's just the irony of being lazy, right? And I've already sort of touched on it, if you've noticed it already, the irony of being lazy. But look at this verse in Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15 says, The way of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. Now, what I find ironic about laziness is that it's actually harder to be lazy, right? Because when, you, when you're lazy and you have to make up for what you do, you know, if you're not organized, for example, or you have to, you've put something off and now you've got to all of a sudden do it, or, you know, you're, you're cleaning, you've just left it to, for so long and now you have to, it's actually harder then to do that job, to, to, to pull off that event or to finish that task or to clean your house when you've been putting it off for so long. So if there's one thing you can take away from this sermon is actually being diligent and just maintaining doing the small things every day, every week, that is actually easier than putting it off, right? And being lazy. That's why the Bible says here, the way of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns, right? It's dangerous. It's a lot harder to get through, but the way of the righteous is made plain. See, when you're organized, when you, when you, have, when you, when you do the extra work at the front to, to, to know what to, to plan out, you know, you just maintain certain things, it makes life so much easier for you. And that's the irony of being lazy, is that if a lazy person was not void of understanding, if somebody truly was lazy and wanted to do less work, they would actually be diligent, <laughs> right? And that's why the Bible says there's more hope of a fool um, than of the sluggard. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, Lord, help us not to be lazy. Me especially, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that the word would speak to us, that we would see characteristics in your word that would, that would apply to ourselves. And help us, Lord, not to be lazy. Help us not to sleep away our life. Help us not to be stubborn when it comes to just fulfilling the little tasks. Help us realize, help us realize, Lord, that it is actually easier and less risky and less damaging to our life just to be diligent and be proactive and do the little things in our life than to be lazy and procrastinate and put it off and be brother to a great waster. So, Lord, we thank you for this teaching and pray, Lord, that we would uh, internalize it uh, Lord, that we would not leave the same person we came as and all of us, Lord, would be more diligent and seek to, you know, strive unto perfection in our spiritual life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.